Chapter 6 The Swine Things It was evening, a week later. My sister sat in the garden knitting. I was walking up and down, reading. My gun leant up against the wall of the house, for since the advent of that strange thing in the gardens, I deemed it wise to take precautions. Yet through the whole week there had been nothing to alarm me, either by sight or sound, so that I was able to look back calmly to the incident, though still with a sense of unmitigated wonder and curiosity. I was, as I've just said, walking up and down and somewhat engrossed in my book. Suddenly I heard a crash away in the direction of the pit. With a quick movement I turned and saw a tremendous column of dust rising high into the evening air. My sister had risen to her feet with a sharp exclamation of surprise and fright. Telling her to stay where she was, I snatched up my gun and ran towards the pit. As I neared it, I heard a dull rumbling sound that grew quickly into a roar split with deeper crashes, and up from the pit drove a fresh volume of dust. The noise ceased, though the dust still rose tumultuously. I reached the edge and looked down, but could see nothing save a boil of dust clouds swirling hither and thither. The air was so full of the small particles that they blinded and choked me, and finally I had to run out from the smother to breathe. Gradually the suspended matter sank, and hung in a panoply over the mouth of the pit. I could only guess at what had happened. That there had been a landslip of some kind I had little doubt, but the cause was beyond my knowledge, and yet, even then, I had half-imaginings, for already the thought had come to me of those falling rocks and that thing in the bottom of the pit, but in the first minutes of confusion I failed to reach the natural conclusion to which the catastrophe pointed. Slowly the dust subsided until presently I was able to approach the edge and look down. For a while I appeared impotently trying to see through the reek. At first it was impossible to make out anything. Then as I stared I saw something below, to my left, that moved. I looked intently towards it and presently made out another, and then another three dim shapes that appeared to be climbing up the side of the pit. I could see them only indistinctly. Even as I stared and wondered I heard a rattle of stones somewhere to my right. I glanced across but could see nothing. I leaned forward and peered over and down into the pit just beneath where I stood and saw no further than a hideous white swine face that had risen to within a couple of yards of my feet. Below it I could make out several others. As the thing saw me it gave a sudden, uncouth squeal which was answered from all parts of the pit. At that a gust of horror and fear took me, and, bending down, I discharged my gun right into its face. Straight away the creature disappeared, with a clatter of loose earth and stones. There was a momentary silence, to which, probably, I owe my life, for during it I heard a quick patter of many feet, and, turning sharply, saw a troop of the creatures coming towards me at a run. Instantly I raised my gun and fired at the foremost, who plunged headlong with a hideous howling. Then I turned to run. More than halfway from the house to the pit I saw my sister. She was coming towards me. I couldn't see her face, distinctly, for the dusk had fallen, but there was fear in her voice as she called to know why I was shooting. Run! I shouted in reply. Run for your life! Without more ado, she turned and fled, picking up her skirts with both hands. As I followed, I gave a glance behind. The brutes were running on their hind legs, at times dropping on all fours. I think it must have been the terror in my voice that spurred Mary to run, for I feel convinced that she had not, as yet, seen those hell creatures that pursued. On we went, my sister leading. Each moment the nearing sounds of the footsteps told me that the brutes were gaining on us, rapidly. Fortunately, I am accustomed to live, in some ways, an active life, as it was the strain of the race was beginning to tell severely upon me. Ahead I could see the back door. Luckily, it was open. I was some half-dozen yards behind Mary now, and my breath was sobbing in my throat. Then something touched my shoulder. I wrenched my head around quickly and saw one of those monstrous, pallid faces close to mine. One of the creatures, having outrun its companions, had almost overtaken me. Even as I turned, it made a fresh grab. With a sudden effort I sprang to one side, and, swinging my gun by the barrel, brought it crashing down upon the foul creature's head. The thing dropped, with an almost human groan. Even this short delay had been nearly sufficient to bring the rest of the brutes down upon me, so that, without an instant's waste of time, I turned and ran for the door. Reaching it, I burst into the passage, then, turning quickly, 
slammed and bolted the door just as the first of the creatures rushed against it with a sudden shock. My sister sat, gasping, in a chair. She seemed in a fainting condition, but I had no time then to spend on her. I had to make sure that all the doors were fastened. Fortunately, they were. The one leading from my study into the gardens was the last to which I went. I had just time to note that it was secured when I thought I heard a noise outside. I stood perfectly silent and listened. Yes, now I could distinctly hear a sound of whispering and something slithered over the panels with a rasping, scratchy noise. Evidently, some of the brutes were feeling with their claw hands about the door to discover whether there were any means of ingress. That the creature should so soon have found the door was, to me, proof of their reasoning capabilities. It assured me that they must not be regarded by any means as mere animals. I had felt something of this before when the first thing peered in through the window. Then I had applied the term superhuman to it with an almost instinctive knowledge that the creature was something different from the brute beast, something beyond human, yet in no good sense, but rather as something foul and hostile to the great and good in humanity. In a word, as something intelligent and yet inhuman. The very thought of the creatures filled me with revulsion. Now I bethought me of my sister, and going to the cupboard I got out a flask of brandy and a wine glass. At taking these I went down to the kitchen, carrying a lighted candle with me. She was not sitting in the chair, but had fallen out and was lying upon the floor face downwards. Very gently I turned her over and raised her head somewhat. Then I poured a little of the brandy between her lips. After a while she shivered slightly. A little later she gave several gasps and opened her eyes. In a dreamy, unrealising way she looked at me. Then her eyes closed, slowly, and I gave her a little more of the brandy. For perhaps a minute longer she lay silent, breathing quickly. All at once her eyes opened again, and it seemed to me as I looked that the pupils were dilated, as though fear had come with returning consciousness. Then, with a movement so unexpected that I started backwards, she sat up. Noticing that she seemed giddy, I put out my hand to steady her. At that she gave a loud scream and, scrambling to her feet, ran from the room. For a moment I stayed there, kneeling and holding the brandy flask. I was utterly puzzled and astonished. Could she be afraid of me? But no, why should she? I could only conclude that her nerves were badly shaken and that she was temporarily unhinged. Upstairs I heard a door bang loudly and I knew that she'd taken refuge in her room. I put the flask down on the table. My attention was distracted by a noise in the direction of the back door. I went towards it and listened. It appeared to be shaken, as though some of the creatures struggled with it silently, but it was far too strongly constructed and hung to be easily moved. Out in the gardens rose a continuous sound. It might have been mistaken by a casual listener for the grunting and squealing of a herd of pigs, but as I stood there it came to me that there was sense and meaning to all those swinish noises, Gradually I seemed to trace a resemblance in it to human speech, glutinous and sticky, as though each articulation was made with difficulty. Yet, nevertheless, I was becoming convinced that it was no mere medley of sounds, but a rapid interchange of ideas. By this time it had grown quite dark in the passages, and from these came all the varied cries and groans of which an old house is so full after nightfall. It is, no doubt, because things are then quieter, and one has more leisure to hear. Also there may be something in the theory that the sudden change of temperature at sundown affects the structure of the house somewhat, causing it to contract and settle, as it were, for the night. However, this is as may be, but on that night in particular I would gladly have been quit of so many dree noises. It seemed to me that each crack and creak was the coming of one of those things along the dark corridors, though I knew in my heart that this could not be, for I had seen myself that all the doors were secure. Gradually, however, these sounds grew on my nerves to such an extent that, were it only to punish my cowardice, I felt I must make the round of the basement again, and if anything were there, face it, and then I would go up to my study, for I knew sleep was out of the question, with the house surrounded by creatures, half beasts, half something else, and entirely unholy. Taking the kitchen lamp down from its hook, I made my way from cellar to cellar and room to room, through pantry and coal hole, along passages and into the hundred and one little blind alleys and hidden nooks that formed the basement of the old house. 
Then, when I knew I had been in every corner and cranny large enough to conceal aught of any size, I made my way to the stairs. With my foot on the first step, I paused. It seemed to me I heard a movement, apparently from the buttery, which is to the left of the staircase. It had been one of the first places I searched, and yet I felt certain my ears had not deceived me. My nerves were strung now, and with hardly any hesitation I stepped up to the door, holding the lamp above my head. In a glance I saw that the place was empty, save for the heavy stone slabs, supported by brick pillars, and I was about to leave, convinced that I'd been mistaken, when, in turning, my light was flashed back from two bright spots outside the window and high up. For a few moments I stood there, staring. Then they moved, revolving slowly, and throwing out alternate scintillations of green and red. At least, so it appeared to me. I knew then that they were eyes. Slowly I traced the shadowy outline of one of the things. It appeared to be holding onto the bars of the window, and its attitude suggested climbing. I went nearer to the window, and held the light higher. There was no need to be afraid of the creature, the bars were strong, and there was little danger of its being able to move them. And then, suddenly, in spite of the knowledge that the brute could not reach to harm me, I had a return of the horrible sensation of fear that had assailed me on that night a week previously. It was the same feeling of helpless, shuddering fright. I realised, dimly, that the creature's eyes were looking into mine with a steady, compelling stare. I tried to turn away, but could not. I seemed now to see the window through a mist. Then I thought other eyes came and peered, and yet others, until a whole galaxy of malignant, staring orbs seemed to hold me in thrall. My head began to swim and throb violently. Then I was aware of a feeling of acute physical pain in my left hand. It grew more severe, and forced, literally forced, my attention. With a tremendous effort I glanced down, and with that the spell that had held me was broken. I realised then that I had, in my agitation, unconsciously caught hold of the hot lamp glass and burned my hand badly. I looked up to the window again. The misty appearance had gone, and now I saw that it was crowded with dozens of bestial faces. With a sudden access of rage, I raised the lamp and hurled it full at the window. It struck the glass, smashing a pane, and passed between two of the bars out into the garden, scattering burning oil as it went. I heard several loud cries of pain, and as my sight became accustomed to the dark, I discovered that the creatures had left the window. Pulling myself together, I groped for the door, and having found it, made my way upstairs, stumbling at each step. I felt dazed, as though I'd received a blow on the head. At the same time, my hand smarted badly, and I was full of a nervous, dull rage against those things. Reaching my study, I lit the candles. As they burnt up, their rays were reflected from the rack of firearms on the side wall. At the sight, I remembered that I had there a power which, as I proved earlier, seemed as fatal to those monsters as to more ordinary animals, and I determined I would take the offensive. First of all, I bound up my hand, for the pain was fast becoming intolerable. After that, it seemed easier, and I crossed the room to the rifle stand. There I selected a heavy rifle, an old and tried weapon, and having procured ammunition, I made my way up into one of the small towers, with which the house is crowned. From there I found that I could see nothing. The gardens presented a dim blur of shadows, a little blacker perhaps where the trees stood. That was all, and I knew that it was useless to shoot down into all that darkness. The only thing to be done was to wait for the moon to rise. Then I might be able to do a little execution. In the meantime I sat still and kept my ears open. The gardens were comparatively quiet now, and only an occasional grunt or squeal came up to me. I did not like this silence. It made me wonder on what devilry the creatures were bent. Twice I left the tower and took a walk through the house, but everything was silent. Once I heard a noise from the direction of the pit, as though more earth had fallen. Following this, and lasting for some fifteen minutes, there was a commotion among the denizens of the gardens. This died away, and after that all was again quiet. About an hour later the moon's light showed above the distant horizon. From where I sat I could see it above the trees, but it was not until it rose clear of them that I could make out any of the details in the gardens below. Even then I could see none of the brutes, until, happening to crane forward, I saw several of them lying prone up against the wall of the house. 
What they were doing I couldn't make out. It was, however, a chance too good to be ignored, and taking aim I fired at the one directly beneath. There was a shrill scream, and as the smoke cleared away I saw that it had turned on its back and was writhing feebly. Then it was quiet. The others had disappeared. Immediately after this I heard a loud squeal in the direction of the pit. It was answered a hundred times from every part of the garden. This gave me some notion of the number of the creatures, and I began to feel that the whole affair was becoming even more serious than I'd imagined. As I sat there, silent and watchful, the thought came to me, why was all this? What were these things? What did it mean? Then my thoughts flew back to that vision, though even now I doubt whether it was a vision, of the plane of silence. What did that mean, I wondered? And the thing in the arena? Ugh. Lastly, I thought of the house I had seen in that faraway place. That house, so like this in every detail of external structure, that it might have been modelled from it. Or this from that. I'd never thought of that. At this moment there came another long squeal from the pit, followed a second later by a couple of shorter ones. At once the garden was filled with answering cries. I stood up quickly and looked over the parapet. In the moonlight it seemed as though the shrubberies were alive. They tossed hither and thither, as though shaken by a strong, irregular wind, while a continuous rustling and a noise of scampering feet rose up to me. Several times I saw the moonlight gleam on running white figures among the bushes, and twice I fired. The second time, my shot was answered by a short squeal of pain. A minute later, the gardens lay silent. From the pit came a deep, hoarse babble of swine talk. At times, angry cries smote the air, and they'd be answered by multitudinous gruntings. It occurred to me that they were holding some kind of council, perhaps to discuss the problem of entering the house. Also, I thought they seemed much enraged, probably by my successful shots. It occurred to me that now would be a good time to make a final survey of our defences. This I proceeded to do at once, visiting the whole of the basement again and examining each of the doors. Luckily, they're all, like the back one, built of solid, iron-studded oak. Then I went upstairs to the study. I was more anxious about this door. It is, palpably, of a more modern make than the others, and, though a stout piece of work, it has little of their ponderous strength. I must explain here that there's a small raised lawn on this side of the house upon which this door opens, the windows of the study being barred on this account. All the other entrances, except the great gateway, which is never opened, are in the lower storey. <laughs>